Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 13 on alveolar ventilation and VQ matching or otherwise known as ventilation perfusion matching. Okay so I want to talk about what alveolar ventilation is. So in the previous lectures we talked about pulmonary ventilations and although they're related and they're similar they're not identical. So in pulmonary ventilation if you recall that was the tidal volume which is typically about 500 mLs and it's multiplied by the respiratory rate, which on average is around, let's say, 12 breaths per minute. And so it gives you a volume of air per minute that we are, that we are breathing. Uh, and I, I compared this to, say, the cardiac output, which was, you know, the uh, volume, the stroke volume times the, you know, heart rate, because they're related in that way. Now, with alveolar ventilation, we're being a little more specific because in pulmonary ventilation, that's all the air we're breathing in per minute. That's filling up the conducting zones of our airways as well as the respiratory zones. However, with alveolar, we're being specific to just the, the gas exchange areas, okay, the alveoli, right? So not all the air that we breathe in when we inhale reaches the alveoli. And for, say, an average adult at about 150 pounds or so, 150 mils will actually fill up the conducting zone. So if you remember, the tidal volume is approximately 500 milliliters. That's the volume we're breathing in under resting uh, respirations. 150 mils of that stays in the conducting zone. And now the rest of it, the 350 mLs, will get to the alveoli. Now you can calculate this because it is dependent on the person's size. So the larger, the, the larger they are, the more um, you know, conducting zones they have, for example. Uh, and in fact, a, a rough calculation of this is about one mil one milliliter per pound of body weight. If you wanted to, you know, calculate the just the conducting zone volume. So, for example, a 150 pound person would have 150 mils filling the conducting zone, so not reaching the alveoli. If you had a 200 pound person, it would be 200 mils, and so on. Anatomic dead space. All right, this is the conducting airways. All right, where there's no gas exchange, and I've talked about this in the previous lectures. It just means we're filling that area up with air, but there's no gas exchange occurring in that spot. So we call it an, an anatomic dead space. And we all have that, right? It's part of the trachea uh, and the major bronchi and so on. In pulmonary diseases, however, the alveoli, remember the alveoli under normal conditions will exchange gas. But in some pulmonary diseases, they may be unable to exchange gases even at the level they're supposed to, which is in the alveoli. And so we combine the dead space where there's no exchange of gas. So that's the anatomic dead space, which is our normal, okay? Plus, combine that with the physiologic or total dead space. And so that's the alveoli that are not exchanging when they're supposed to. And so the sum of the anatomic dead space plus any pathological alveolar dead space, and you can calculate, you know, your, your total dead space, and we'll kind of be talking more about that, okay? So this is really any area where gas exchange is not occurring. And obviously in the alveoli, that would be pathological if that was the case. So on the previous slide, I went over some of the terms in terms of anatomic dead space and physiologic dead space. Now, again, under normal conditions, the anatomic dead space we all have. Physiologic dead space is including any pathological dead space that's in the gas exchange areas. Now, if a person inhales 500 mLs of air, right, that's a typical tidal volume at rest, and they have 150 mLs stays in the anatomic dead space, okay, they're not exchanging areas, then you have 350 mLs that actually gets into the alveoli, right? So I want to know what the, what the ventilation is, right? So to calculate that, you know, how much of that air is exchange, being exchanged at the level of the alveoli every minute? So I have to take into account that dead space, right? So air that ventilates the alveoli is 350 mLs times the respiratory rate. All right, so 350 mLs times 12 is going to give me about 4.2 4 liters per minute or 4,200 mLs per minute. Now, this measurement is very, very relevant to the body's ability to uh, get oxygen into the tissue and get rid of carbon dioxide. Because when we ventilate the alveoli, two things are occurring, right? Oxygen is moving into the body and CO2 is leaving. So the rate with which we ventilate the alveoli affects the levels of oxygen, the partial pressures of oxygen, as well as the partial pressures of CO2. Okay, so now I want to compare pulmonary ventilation versus alveolar ventilation. So looking at this chart, this chart demonstrates the point I want to make here. So if we're breathing at rest, and I told you previous in previous lectures that the pulmonary ventilation is the total volume we're breathing in at rest uh, multiplied by the respiratory rate. 
So you can see that the tidal volume, which is 500 mLs, all right? So with every breath, we're moving 500 mLs, and we're taking 12 breaths per minute. And so our pulmonary ventilation, which is over here, comes out to about 6,000 mLs per minute, or 6 liters per minute. And that was something I had talked about previously. But in now, in today's lecture, I'm telling you that we have to account for dead space. What I want to know is what is the alveolar ventilation? Because I'm not getting uh, all 500 mLs of that air that I'm breathing in. Not all of it's going to end up in the alveoli. So how much is going to end up in the alveoli? Well, a typical dead space right, is about 150 mLs, as I've described already. So what we're doing is we're subtracting off the dead space. So for example, I usually say, all right, well, 500 mLs times the respiratory rate is going to give me 6 liters per minute, okay? But now I want to account for that dead space. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say the tidal volume, 500 mLs, minus the 150 mLs of dead space that's not getting into the alveoli. So I'm breathing it in. It's filling up all that conducting zone airways there, trachea, the bronchi, and so on. So it fills up all those areas up to a volume of about 150 mLs. So that comes out to about 350. So 350 mLs times 12. So what I've done is I've just simply subtracted off the, the dead space, the dead space air. That air is not making it to the alveoli. So I get 350 mLs times 12, and that's going to come out to 4.2 liters per minute. All right, so... Yeah, although my pulmonary ventilation says six, you know, six liters per minute, the actual air that's reaching my alveoli every minute is about 4.2, okay? And again, that's because I've accounted for this dead space here. Now, I can change the rate and depth with which I breathe, okay? And this can occur automatically, like if I'm exercising or something, or I have anxiety, but I can also consciously do it too, right? So let's take a look at at this effect, and this is why alveolar ventilation makes such makes such a difference um, when compared to pulmonary in understanding what's happening in terms of gas exchange. So, for example, let's say I'm doing deep, slow breathing, like they do in meditation, right, where they're taking much, you know, they're taking far fewer breaths, but they're much deeper. I've increased my tidal volume, let's say, to 1.2 liters, so I'm deep, taking in a lot more volume, and my respiratory rate. I've gone down to 5, so it's not 12. So 1,200 times 5, in terms of pulmonary ventilation, so 1,200 times 5 would be 6 liters. So the pulmonary ventilation hasn't changed. All I've done is compensate. I've increased the volume and decreased the respiratory rate, and I end up with the same pulmonary ventilation. But how has that affected my alveolar ventilation? How has that affected the amount of air that's actually reaching the alveoli? So let's take a look at that. Again, the dead space doesn't change because that's an anatomic fixture. All right, so in our average adult here, it's going to be 150 mLs. That's not going to change. So it's now 1,200 minus the dead space, okay, times 5. And take a look here. You see my alveolar ventilation has gone up, you know, fairly significantly. Even though my pulmonary ventilation hasn't changed, my alveolar ventilation has increased. So the amount of air that's actually reaching my alveoli has gone up. Okay, so this is an important difference between the two. Even though I'm taking in the same pulmonary ventilation, the alveolar ventilation has actually increased, and that's because I'm accounting for that dead space. Now, the last one here is shallow, rapid breathing, right? <laughs> Somebody's breathing really fast but very shallow. So their tidal volume is 150. So this is a much smaller volume that they're taking in with every breath, and they're breathing at a rate of 40 times per minute. Now, if I just multiply those two together, my pulmonary ventilation, again, is going to be 6,000 or 6 liters per minute. So the pulmonary ventilation in all three examples is exactly the same. How is my alveolar ventilation, how has that been affected? So take a look, my dead space, 150 of my tidal volume minus 150 of dead space, that's zero. Zero times 40 is zero. So in other words, what happened here in rapid shallow breathing is despite that I'm bringing in air and I'm breathing rapidly, I'm actually not uh, ventilating my alveoli at all. Okay, the, the volume I'm bringing in is too little. It doesn't, it, it doesn't surpass the dead space volume. And so therefore, it never reaches my alveoli. So in this case, this person isn't breathing. They're suffocating. Okay, now this would be, you know, a, a form of, say, uh, hyperventilation. All right, 
And uh, you know, this type of hyperventilation with it's very deep and, and shallow. We're not getting any exchange with the alveoli at all. So we're not bringing in any new O2 to the alveoli to be exchanged, and we're not getting rid of any CO2. So CO2 can build up, all right? So this would be the problem. Is without the, that air exchange, I can't exchange those gases. Okay, so now this exchange of, of air at the alveoli, right? This ventilation that's occurring, it affects the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2, as I've alluded to in the previous slides. All right, so let's, let's take a look at that relationship more closely at resting levels. So again, down here at the x-axis, you see alveolar ventilations in liters per minute. All right, so I'm going to start there. And again, I'm using sort of our standard person here. So I'm going to say that the alveolar ventilation, right, we're going to tell you about 500 mLs. So it's typically about 500 mLs minus the dead space, which is typically about 150 times, we'll say the respiratory rate is about 12. So that's going to give me an alveolar ventilation of 4,200 mLs per minute or 4.2 liters. So since I'm doing liters down here, you see four liters. I'm going to go a little bit further. So here's 4.2 liters approximately there. All right, I'm going to draw my standard line. So give me one second here. I'm going to draw a line that's a vertical line going straight up right here just to mark off our normal alveolar ventilation at 4.2 liters. Now I'm also going to make a point right here. And I'm going to draw a line that goes like this. Okay. Now, this green line that I just drawn represents the partial pressure of CO2 and how it's affected by the alveolar ventilation. So let's take a look at this. At a ventilation of 4.2 liters, which is our resting, all right, 4.2 liters per minute, you'll notice that the partial pressure of CO2, which is on my the left y-axis over here, so partial pressure of CO2, which is right here, all right, Again, this is in millimeters of mercury, that pressure is approximately 40 millimeters of mercury, which is what I've described in previous lectures to you, that the uh, under standard resting conditions, that partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli is 40, and it's 46 in the returning blood, right? So it's 40 in the alveoli. And so that's what it would be under our standard ventilating, about 12 breaths per minute and so on. Now. Let's say I were to, you know, hypoventilate, meaning I'm not going to ventilate the alveolar as, alveoli as much. I'm going to be moving in this direction. You'll notice that as I move in that direction, the slope of the line increases, which means the CO2 is increasing. So in other words, if I'm not bringing air into the alveoli to exchange, the CO2 level is going to accumulate in my alveoli. And, you know, uh, in return, it's also going to cause an increase in my CO2 level in my blood as well, since it's not going to be able to transition into the alveoli as readily. So if I hypoventilate, the CO2 accumulates. If I increase alveolar ventilation, all right, increase, now I'm not talking about hyperventilation where I'm, you know, taking very shallow breaths and very rapid rate. I'm talking about an increase in alveolar ventilation where I'm taking, let's say, deep, slow breaths, for example. I'd be moving in the opposite direction now. Instead, I'd be bringing more air to the alveoli so I can exchange that air uh, more readily. And so I'm exchanging a larger volume, I should say. And so you'll notice that the curve of CO2 is decreasing. So if I increase alveolar ventilation, the CO2 levels go down. They start to decrease. All right? And then it follows that pattern. So again, depending on how I ventilate, my CO2 is affected by that. Now let's take a look at a different point. I'm going to put another point on my, my vertical line here at about, say, about 100. All right. So about a, a 100 millimeters of mercury. And should go like this. Now, this is actually my partial pressure of O2. So this is how oxygen's partial pressure is affected by alveolar ventilation. So you can see, if I were to increase ventilation again, my alveolar ventilation, my CO2 would go down because I'm breathing off more CO2 in that exchange, and I'm bringing in more oxygen. 
So the more I increase my alveolar ventilation, the greater the oxygen I bring in, and the, the lower the content of CO2. And that makes logical sense too. Now, if I were to hypoventilate or decrease the ventilation of my alveoli, what's going to happen is the O2 levels are going to drop because I'm not exchanging air anymore, right? I'm not bringing in any new oxygen and I'm not getting rid of the CO2. So CO2 levels go up and oxygen levels decrease. So, so far, hopefully that makes sort of logical sense, but you can see how it works here graphically as well. Now, there is one more thing I have to add in terms of the oxygen and the partial pressure of oxygen, because in the blood, let me use a different color here. I'm going to draw this as best I can. I'm going to draw these little dashed lines here in purple there. And that little purple line that I've just drawn is going to represent O2 saturation. And so the O2 saturation is the saturation of hemoglobin. So we know that as the partial pressure of oxygen is up to about 100 uh, millimeters of mercury, effectively the hemoglobin is 100% saturated. And that's why it plateaus at that point. So even if the partial pressure of oxygen continues to go up inside the alveoli, um, it might dissolve a little bit more oxygen into the blood directly, but that's a, a much less uh, or a far less uh, concentration of oxygen compared to what can bind to hemoglobin as I've discussed in the previous lecture. So in this case what it's trying to show you is this is that the relationship that oxygen has with hemoglobin and the fact that it's the hemoglobin saturates at a partial pressure of 100 already so even if I go to 110 or a partial pressure of 150 let's say the saturation is not really going to increase on hemoglobin any further and what you'll see here is if I if I hypoventilate right or excuse me if I increase the alveolar ventilation uh, I'm not really going to saturate the hemoglobin any further. I'm really kind of maximize the quantity of oxygen that I can have. However, if I uh, hypoventilate, so I decrease the amount I'm ventilating, right? Again, I'm moving in, in the direction towards the left. You'll notice that even if the partial pressure of oxygen were to say decrease, okay, uh, if the partial pressure of oxygen decreases, I'm still basically fully saturating at a wide range of partial pressures, which is again is what I described in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Now my drawing here is not perfect, but technically speaking, if I were to desaturate, uh, excuse me, if the partial pressure were to decrease to about say 60 um, millimeters of mercury of oxygen from decreasing my, my alveolar ventilation, my saturation, right, my saturation of oxygen hasn't appreciably decreased all that much. My hemoglobin is still saturating pretty well. But if I drop much further than 60, once I go to 50 and 40 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen, then the saturation of hemoglobin is going to drop off pretty precipitously. And again, this is a, a protective mechanism. This is allowing us to maintain a good saturation of hemoglobin, even with really big changes in our alveolar uh, ventilation. All right, so again, if I hypoventilate, the PO2 will come down according to that blue curve I've drawn, but the effect it has on the saturation of hemoglobin is less pronounced. Whereas the effect on CO2, CO2 doesn't have that sort of binding curve, it's still linear. So you know, if I hypoventilate, the CO2 will go up uh, more linearly, if you will. All right, there's one last piece I want to add to this graph. I'm going to draw a point right approximately there at about 7.4. So now I'm going to look at how the pH is affected by the alveolar ventilation. We had a curve that approximately looks like this, and this, this curve represents the pH of our blood. Now, you'll notice I put the, the, the points along our normal here at 7.4. So that coincides with 7.4, which is our normal pH of our arterial blood. Now, uh, you'll see that is if I increase my ventilation, you'll notice that the pH goes up as I increase the ventilation, as I drop the CO2 level. So this is a reminder of the relationship between CO2 and the pH. So just to remind you guys here, CO2 plus water becomes H2CO3, which becomes HCO3 minus plus a hydrogen ion. Sorry, I had to draw it down there. But now you see, here's the CO2 and here's the proton. So that's how these two are related. So in other words, as I increase my alveolar ventilation, you'll notice that my pH, all right, my pH starts to go up because I'm dropping my CO2. And that makes sense based on this, this equilibrium, right? As the CO2 goes down, 
the equilibrium is going to shift and move the other way. In other words, bicarb is going to bind to more protons, so it's removing free protons, and the free protons are what dictate the pH. So as I remove those protons and I shift the equation back to replace the CO2 that was lost, uh, I'm increasing my pH. I'm becoming less acidic, more alkaline. And now the opposite is true. If I uh, decrease my ventilation, I hypoventilate, so I'm bringing less air into that alveoli, you'll see the CO2 goes up. So it's the opposite effect. The CO2 increases, and since the CO2 is increasing, it's going to shift the equation back towards the production of more protons, and that's going to make me more acidic. So you'll notice that as the CO2 goes up, the pH starts to come down. And so what's great about this particular graph is it shows you the relationship with alveolar ventilation. So again, the rate with which I'm breathing, the depth with which I'm breathing, how much air is actually reaching the alveoli, it affects the partial pressure of O2 and CO2. And in turn, that will affect the pH as well as the, uh, the saturation of, of the hemoglobin. Okay, so really, uh, this is just a repeat of everything I just drew out for you, but it's the one that you see in your notes. All right, not as colorful, but still. All right, it's the same, same information, and really, it, the takeaway here is, is how alveolar ventilation, the air that gets into the alveoli for exchange, uh, whether we you know, increase it or decrease it, uh, it affects the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2. And oxygen and CO2 have an inverse relationship. You know, if we increase the ventilation, O2 goes up, but CO2 goes down. And um, you know, if O2 is going down because we're hypoventilating, we can still maintain a fair, a fair amount of uh, oxygen concentration in our blood simply because we can still saturate the hemoglobin fairly effectively, even at low partial pressures of oxygen, whereas CO2 doesn't have that relationship. So we tend to accumulate, we could accumulate uh, more CO2. And this is, again, the CO2 is related to the, the, the pH. So if there's a drop in the CO2, then the, the pH goes up. If there's an increase in CO2, uh, then the, the pH will come down. And then finally, last point here, is you can see that each of these points that cross our midline, so the midline here, it's showing you an alveolar ventilation of close to 5 liters per minute, which is fine. But let's say we have here, all right. So at each one of these cross points here on our normal, that's the vertical line, you'll see that it, it coincides with the normal values that we've talked about. So for example, the CO2 is at 40 millimeters of mercury, uh, the pH is about 7.4, and then that the, the O2 is approximately close to about 100 millimeters of mercury. So those are all values that we've seen in the previous lectures. And that's all maintained by our alveolar ventilation. So for example, if we were to exercise, our ventilation changes. We'll take deeper breaths, uh, and we change the you know our respiratory rate, which could also go up. So we could increase our alveolar ventilation. That's going to bring in more oxygen, help us to, to unload some of that CO2 that we're producing. Okay, and also will help us ultimately to maintain our pH so that doesn't change. Okay, so now I want to talk about ventilation perfusion ratio. All right, so this is comparing the ventilatory rate, so the amount of air we're bringing in over time, and comparing it to the blood flow over time. So it's comparing airflow and blood flow. We want that to match as optimally as possible to optimize gas exchange. So bringing in that air, it has to have good blood flow, otherwise the air doesn't go anywhere. Uh, if we don't have good airflow and there's good blood flow, we're not getting any of the, the, the gas, right? So and we can't get rid of the CO2. So we need to make sure that there's a match between these two. And um, if there's any kind of difference between the two, the, there's a built-in mechanisms to help adjust it to bring it to the optimal ventilation and perfusion ratio. So the primary thing I'm going to be really focusing on is the blood vessels. So pulmonary blood vessels, all right, they change in the diameter uh, depending on airflow to the area of the lungs, which is actually something I talked about in the previous lecture when I said that if an area of the lung, let's say, is has reduced airflow, it's going to vasoconstrict blood flow to those areas and shut blood flow to areas that are being ventilated so that we can maintain uh, you know, good VQ and make sure that we're getting that gas exchange that we need so that we're not wasting blood flow to areas that are not getting in good air. Um, so uh, yeah, for, for example here, if an area is poorly ventilated, we'll just constrict to that area and shunt it to somewhere where the ventilation is better. The bronchi can also play a small role in this. They can actually change their diameter. 
uh, depending on the blood flow to the area of the lungs as well. So if an area is really well perfused, you know, a little bronchodilation can occur to increase the ventilation. And the whole idea is that we're, we're adjusting ventilation via the bronchi or adjusting uh, perfusion, you know, via constriction or dilation uh, of the vessels to match the VQ and make sure that they match as, as um, effectively as possible. So in this cartoon, what it's showing you uh, is kind of how this works uh, from the uh, perfusion standpoint. So here you can see there's a, a decreased airflow. So we'll start on this curve here. So I have reduced ventilation. All right, so the ventilation has gone down. That means there's reduced PO2 in the blood vessels, right? Because if I decrease my ventilation, I don't get good uh, oxygen in. So vasoconstriction is going to occur. So pulmonary vessels will, will vasoconstrict. That's going to decrease the blood flow to that area. All right. And, it's, and uh, that's going to result in, in, in uh, matching the airflow and the blood flow, right? So we reduce the flow. So if an area has reduced ventilation, what we do is we reduce the perfusion of that area to match it. And so that way we, we get the same ratio. And so this is how it responses, it responds to, you know, reduced ventilation. On the other hand, if I were to increase the ventilation to an area, so I have increased airflow. So the PO2 actually is elevated. I'm getting more oxygen into the alveoli there. Vasodilation is going, going to occur. That's going to increase blood flow to that area. Again, to keep the ratio the same. If ventilation goes up, bring up the perfusion to maintain that ratio, to maintain that optimal exchange. Now, this can occur in parts of the lung. If, let's say, there's some sort of infection going on where we can, you know, uh, adjust, you know, into, in local areas. Or this could happen throughout the entire lung. Okay, you could be hypoventilating the entire lung. And so it'll just reduce the, the perfusion. Uh, to match. And again, it's all about maintaining that ventilation perfusion ratio. Okay, so now in terms of the VQ in our healthy lungs, depending on what area of the lung, we actually have different VQs, different ventilation and perfusion. So let's start with zone two. Zone two. So zone two is actually the center portion of the lung, which is, you know, essentially at the level of, let's say, the, the, the heart, for example. Okay. And the v, so it's going to have a specific VQ, and it's going to be really a kind of our standard VQ. So let's let's say, for example, uh, let's make a quick calculation. So a VQ, ventilation over perfusion, let's do a quick calculation and say that the ventilation, based on the numbers we've been talking about, uh, let's say that's approximately, an alveolar ventilation is about four, four, sorry about this, four liters per minute. All right. It was 4.2 in the previous example. I was around at the four. And that the flow, the blood flow, you know, a typical cardiac output in an average adult is going to be about five liters per minute. So that's our ventilation to perfusion, typically, under standard resting conditions. So four out of five, that's uh, that's about eighty, um, about 0.8, right? So it's going to equal about 0 0.8, which is uh, our standard ratio between ventilation and perfusion. And so that's typically what we're going to see approximately in this middle zone is about a 0 0.8 ratio. All right, based on that uh, that calculation. Now, if we're upright, gravity does play a role. And what ends up happening is this, is that in the apex or in zone one, the ventilation or the air that reaches the alveoli there is less than it would be in the mid zone, which is a little bit lower. So less air there. So that's why you're seeing a down arrow with the ventilation there. So it's a decrease in ventilation. However, the perfusion is a lot less. Its decrease is, is, is more substantial. And this is at a level above the heart, so gravity kind of plays a role in that as well. And so the perfusion to the apex of the lung is, is much less. So they don't go down in proportion. In fact, the perfusion goes down a lot more so than the ventilation in the apex. So the overall effect on the ratio is to increase the ratio. So in fact, the apex of the lung has an increased VQ. What that means is that it gets a greater ventilation in the apex relative to its perfusion. So it's bringing in more air that is necessary for the perfusion that it's getting. So it can really oxygenate and uh, get rid of CO2 effectively in the apex. Zone two is our, our sort of baseline, our working baseline. And then zone three, zone three, which is slightly below the heart, all right, this uh, has the effect of increasing perfusion and increasing ventilation. And it's the, the same kind of effect. The ventilation does go up at the base of the lung, which is you know, a more compliant part of the lung. So it can bring in more more uh, ventilation, more air, but the impact it has or the effect it has on, on uh, 
perfusion is much greater. And since the ratio is uh, the denominator is going up greater, the perfusion is going up greater than the ventilation is, the effect on the ratio is to decrease it. So again, in the apex, it's an increased VQ. And at the base, it's a decreased VQ. And this is based on the effect it has uh, on you know, ventilation versus perfusion. Perfusion goes way higher in the base and goes down way lower in the apex relative to the change in ventilation. So therefore, that's the ratio. What this, what, how we interpret this at the base, if it has a decreased VQ, it just means there is less ventilation or air getting to the alveoli relative to the amount of blood flow that's there which means we're not getting as optimal an exchange. We're getting a lot of blood that's moving by that's not getting you know, as well uh, as much oxygen. It's not going to be able to get as rid of as much CO2 because we're not moving air as effectively in relation to that blood flow. So you know, over here, the bullet points, you know, greater proportion of inspired air goes to smaller, more compliant lungs at the base. That's why we have an increase in ventilation there. The, at the apex, it's less compliant. As gravity takes hold, it kind of stretches it out and pulls it down, and it makes it less compliant. The shape of the thoracic cage moves the lower lung more than the upper during inspiration. So they're breathing in. There's much more movement at the base of the lung than there is at the apex. And that helps to bring in more air. And blood flow is greater at the base. Um, and that's due to the fact that it's slightly below the heart there. And so more of it's going to be more readily go into the base than it would towards the apex. Okay, so now um, in terms of VQ mismatches, what I just spoke about in the previous slide was a physiologic mismatch that we have in the apex uh, versus the base of our lungs when we're upright. And of course, that mismatch would actually go away if we were to lie down because we change the pattern of, of perfusion throughout the lung and we change the pattern of ventilation. Now, um, in terms of these mismatches, all right, if we have an area of low VQ, all right, so in other words, as I, I, I want to state it as a, a decrease in the ventilation relative to my perfusion. Based on the graph that I drew for you guys and how alveolar ventilation's relationship with the partial pressures of oxygen and CO2, you could think of it this way. If I have a decrease in my, uh, my ventilation, okay, my CO2 level would be uh, increased and my O2 level would be decreased. Right? That's due to a drop in the ventilation. So if it's Again, if I'm, I'm comparing that to my perfusion, so my ventilation is relatively reduced relative to my perfusion, what's going to end up happening is in that alveoli, I'm going to have a decreased O2, so it's not exchanging as well, and I'm getting an increase in my CO2. It's building up a little bit. All right. Now, I say PaO2, so that's, a, that's reflecting the alveolar partial pressures, but it would be the same inside the, art, the artery as well. It would be reflected there too. So the arterial PaO2, excuse me, would be reduced because you have a large amount of blood volume relative to what the, the ventilation is. And so we're not oxygenating it very well. And the PaCO2 or the CO2 in the artery would start to actually increase as well because we're also not going to be able to get rid of as much CO2 as readily because we're not ventilating it as well. Now, in terms of the area of high VQ, so this is essentially high ventilation relative to the, perf the perfusion. We're ventilating more than our baseline. And this occurs like at the apex. Now, when we're ventilating more, remember the effect on the O2 and CO2 is to increase the O2 partial pressure and decrease the CO2. And again, that would be reflected as well in the arterial. So the PaO2, the oxygen would go up, right? And then the PaCO2, so the arterial CO2, that would also decrease. And it's because if we're ventilating better at the apex, I'm moving more air relative to that blood volume, and so that means I'm going to drop the CO2 and I'm going to increase that oxygen. And so that's, that's the effect that it has at the apex and the base of our normal functioning lungs. However, under certain pathological conditions, let's say um, I have some sort of blockage of the airway from you know, uh, chronic bronchitis, which is causing inflammation of the airways and, and strictures and reducing those, the diameters there. Okay, that's going to uh, decrease my VQ. It's going to make it so that the ventilation goes down to those alveoli that are being obstructed. And my perfusion, if it stayed the same, right, so that's going to bring my, my VQ down. And um, it could fully obstruct. So what you're saying is the extreme of that obstruction here, what you're seeing over here, if I completely block that airway, I have something we call a shunt. What that means is if I completely block the airway, that means ventilation has gone to zero. So my ventilation is zero. And 
0 over whatever my flow is. So 0 divided by anything is 0. So that's why you're seeing here the VQ ratio is 0. So if we're measuring a VQ, which we can do clinically, you see it's 0. 0 means that uh, there's no ventilation, that the airway is obstructed. And that could be due to mucus buildup, constricted airway, um, you know, small, you know, a child who, you know, in, inhaled a, a small object. Over here is our normal VQ at 0 0.8, which I calculated for in the previous slide. That has to do with the 4 liters per minute over the 5 liters per minute. And here's ventilation without perfusion. So you see here, the blood vessel is blocked. So you can think of something like a pulmonary embolus, right? The embolus went in there and wedged into the, uh, into the blood vessels that are perfusing this alveoli. So you're getting airflow, so ventilation is fine, but the perfusion went to 0. So anything divided by zero is infinite, right? So as the VQ goes towards infinity, meaning it gets larger and larger and larger, that ratio, that's suggesting that you have what we call a dead space. So these are, these are clinical terms that we use. So a dead space is an area that's being ventilated but has no perfusion, okay? A shunt is an area that is being perfused but has no air movement. So blood is shunting past the alveoli and it's not becoming oxygen, it's not exchanging gases at all. We actually have physiologic shunts. So now this is actually going back to um, my last lecture when I told you that typically in an alveoli you could have, and I'll draw the alveoli here, and here's the capillary, you know, partial pressure of oxygen of about 104. And so when it comes into equilibrium as the blood is flowing through here, it's going to be a partial pressure of oxygen in the blood of 104 as well, right? It comes into complete equilibrium. And that's, again, based on our alve alveolar ventilation rate and so on. So it should reach about 104. However, by the time it actually gets to the left atrium, right, so when we get that oxygenated blood that's returning to the heart, the partial pressure of oxygen is about 95 millimeters of mercury. It's not 104. All right, and so this cartoon is actually showing you this. It's saying, all right, well, if the PaO2, they're saying 105, okay, that exchanges with this capillary and it equilibrates to 105, so the partial pressure there is 105. But what it's telling you is that there's other blood that's going to be joining it. So other blood, now this blood is not, um, not exchanging with this alveoli over here, okay, it's not exchanging, it's coming from somewhere else. And you'll see that the partial pressure of oxygen in this particular vessel is 40 millimeters of mercury. And what happens is when these vessels come together, it changes the total partial pressure. It brings it down. So instead of being at 105, in this example, it could bring it down to, say, 100 millimeters of mercury because we're mixing some of the low oxygen content blood with the high oxygen content blood, and that brings down the overall partial pressure. In our bodies, we actually have these physiologic shunts. Again, reminding you that that shunt is where there's, per, there's perfusion without any ventilation. So it's you know, low oxygen content blood. So where this comes from, all right, our physiologic shunts, the ones that we have that are normal, we have bronchial vessels. So the bronchial vessels, these are the vessels that actually feed the lungs and feed the bronchi. So remember, it's not just for the exchange. We also have to make sure that the, the airways themselves, those bronchi, are also getting the blood supply. And they can actually directly connect with the oxygenated blood that's leaving the lung. So they won't return to the right side of the heart. Instead, it connects with the oxygenized uh, blood returning to the left side of the heart. And so now we have some venous blood that's mixing in there with the, the now newly oxygen, oxygenated blood. The BCN veins, uh, these are veins that are located in the heart itself. And instead of these veins uh, directly emptying into the, you know, the right atrium, instead they're very small and they can actually empty into the uh, the left side of the heart and that also contributes to some venous blood now mixing with oxygenated blood and the last thing is the the VQ mismatch the fact of the matter is when you have a, a decreased VQ the partial pressure of oxygen uh, of the blood leaving the let's say you know the uh, the base of the lung there which has a, a reduced VQ its partial pressure of oxygen is going to be less and so you're getting, you know, blood from the base of the lung, which has a lower partial pressure of oxygen, mixing with, uh, you know, blood from the middle and the apex, which is going to have higher partial pressures. And when they come together and ultimately all come together in the left atrium there, you're, you're getting this mix of, uh, you know, 
high oxygenated blood with low, and you end up with an average that's somewhere between 95 and 100 millimeters of mercury on average. So that's what we that's what we see when we take blood from the artery. We measure our partial pressure of oxygen. It's about 95. It's not exactly 104 or 105 because of this mixing of some venous blood in there and some low VQ blood. Okay, so now I want to talk about, you know, with our normal lungs, we do have that VQ mismatch, right? Higher ventilation in the apex, lower ventilation perfusion in the, in the base. Can they offset each other? In other words, uh, we know that, you know, the, the blood that's perfusing these alveoli, right? For example, in this cartoon, which you see, which is in your notes, all right, you see the ventilation, all right? And now if this was, say, an area of low VQ in the lung, all right, where we have decreased ventilation relative to the perfusion. And over here we have a high VQ area. And then the two middle ones are our average VQ areas, about 0.8 or so. Remember, all this blood comes together ultimately here and mixes. Okay? And so if in an area of a low VQ, which is over here, that's going to have a lower partial pressure of oxygen. It's going to have a higher CO2 partial pressure. Again, because there's not as much ventilation there. Whereas the high ventilation area, it's going to be the opposite. An increase in partial pressure of oxygen and a decrease in CO2 because the ventilation is increased. And that's based on that graph that I, I talked about earlier. Okay. So it would seem logically that, you know, if I get this blood that's mixing here, if I have an area of low and high, they might offset each other. Right. So the area of low oxygen, there's an area of higher than normal oxygen. When they come together, it should aver average out to my normal oxygen level. Um, and the CO2, if the CO2 goes up and the CO2 goes down in those areas and they come together, it should all basically, you know, level off and be average right in the middle uh, when they mix. But they don't actually directly offset each other, or at least they don't proportionately offset each other when it comes to oxygen. But they can proportionately offset each other when it comes to CO2. So, for example, we will start with CO2. CO2 can be compensated in mild to moderate VQ matches, mismatches. Okay, so in other words, you know, mild to moderate, meaning, you, you know, if there's a low VQ area and the CO2 is elevated in the blood that's leaving those areas, and then there's an area where you have, uh, you know, high VQ and the, the CO2 is relatively lower, when they mix together, all right, what ends up happening is it kind of offsets each other. So they end up right back at the normal average anyway. So depending on, you know, the ratio of high and low VQ areas, they can kind of offset each other. So that's what we're seeing over here. This, this is showing you partial pressure and the volume percent of CO2. It just means the, the quantity of CO2. And I actually talked about this in the previous lecture, that it's on a linear curve here. All right, that's our, our functioning point here. So this would be our, our working point. All right. Now, in our two middle ones here, I was labeling them as Xs. All right. This would be our X point right here. So they would have a, a certain uh, quantity of CO2, all right? In terms of partial pressure, if you look down, that's going to be about, in this case, about 40, uh, 40 millimeters of mercury, right? That's a typical arterial CO2. Now, an area of low VQ, so an area of low VQ is going to have a higher CO2 content, so that's going to be over here. That's this point. That's low, and this one would be high. So an area of low VQ... It's going to have a higher CO2 quantity uh, in the blood, and an area of high VQ uh, is going to have a, a, uh, a lower quantity of CO2. And you notice it's linear. So what happens is when the low and the high actually mix with each other, it brings the average back down right in the middle. So the average is right in the middle, which is our normal average. So the partial pressures of CO2 end up still being about 40 millimeters of mercury because the high and the low areas of CO2, when they mix together, averages out to be about 40 millimeters of mercury. So it, they, they offset each other and CO2 uh, partial pressure stays the same. But in oxygen, it doesn't work that way. Oxygen cannot be fully compensated like that, okay? When we mix high oxygen and low oxygen areas from high ventilation and, and low ventilation areas of the lung, when we mix that blood, it doesn't average out the same way that CO2 does. It doesn't meet in the middle, which is right back at our, our, our normal point. And that's because the curve isn't linear. So if you look here, we're looking at oxygen. Remember this curve here, the sigmoidal curve, our operating point is about here at about 100 millimeters of mercury. So that would be our two X points here. So that would be the X. That would be our normal alveoli. So 
approximately, let's say, 100 millimeters of mercury in that alveoli, and you get approximately 100 millimeters of mercury in the blood then. But it's going to mix with, you know, uh, low ventilation area. So in the low ventilation area, you're going to have a decreased PO2. So that's what this point is, is trying to, that's what this point is on the curve here. So this represents the low, and this point over here represents the high. Now, if you take a look at that, uh, again, we're looking at quantity of oxygen. My working point is right here. So my normal alveoli will usually give me that point right there. So in the areas of high ventilation, I have a higher partial pressure of oxygen. So maybe about 120 or 130, somewhere over here. But look at what's effect on the total quantity of my oxygen. The difference between the normal and my, new, my now high there is very little difference because for a higher partial pressure of oxygen, I don't actually saturate the hemoglobin much further. It's already almost 98% saturated, so increasing the partial pressure doesn't give me much more. Okay? Yeah, a little bit more will dissolve in the blood, but the amount that dissolves in the blood is negligible. It's very little. Now, a low partial, uh, excuse me, a low ventilation area like over at this point, well, we're going on the down portion of the curve here. So a, a decrease in ventilation, okay, decreasing the PO2 in this, in this fashion, what that does is that has a more pronounced effect compared to my normal alveoli. That has a much more pronounced effect. I mean, a, a decrease in the partial pressure there can more significantly drop the saturation than increasing the, the, um, the partial pressure. So a decrease from a low VQ area has a more pronounced effect. So the average doesn't come to 100 millimeters of mercury because it's not a, it's not like CO2. Instead, since the low uh, VQ area has brought the oxygen content down more significantly than an increase, I end up the the average ends up coming down below somewhere between, uh, which is going to be less than my normal, less than say, you know my my 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure in the blood is going to come down to, uh, you know 90 or 95 or so on. And so the point of this is that. Uh, CO2 can also essentially be uh, compensated for by high and low because of its linear relationship. Uh, and what I mean is fully compensated for, uh, where you know the high area, high ventilation areas can completely offset the low ventilation areas. But it doesn't work that way with oxygen. If you have a low uh, VQ area, that drop in oxygen is more pronounced and will have a greater effect in bringing the overall partial pressure of oxygen down then the high VQ areas can increase it. Okay, so now I want to do a little bit of pathophysiology um, to help kind of solidify some of the physiologic concepts that I've been talking about. So we have something called hypoxemia, which is just low oxygen in the blood. And there are, there are many causes of it, but ones that um, specifically are caused by uh, lung disorders are the following. So you can see it in the table here. So high altitude, so at high altitude, lower barometric pressure, we're bringing in less oxygen, we can become hypoxemic. Hypoventilation. So if you recall, based on that graph we talked about, if I don't um, ventilate the alveoli enough, uh, I can't bring in enough oxygen, right? That can decrease. Diffusion defect. So something wrong with the, you know, some sort of lung infection or disorder in the lung, which is not allowing me to exchange my gases optimally. A VQ defect. So this is kind of something I've already talked about, but some sort of obstruction of the airway or obstruction of the blood flow uh, resulting in a, in a VQ defect. And if I have a complete obstruction, uh, I can create a shunt. So we talked about shunt, shunts and uh, dead spaces. Okay, So a shunt would be a completely blocked airway that there's blood flow but no ventilation. Okay, now there's a term here we have to talk about which is called the AA gradient. So we can look at this, the PaO2, and you can see how each of these would decrease. So overall, every single one of these conditions decreases the amount of oxygen. Okay. Now, the AA gradient, so the large A is the alveolar uh, oxygen, and uh, the small A is the arterial. So this is talking about the partial pressure of oxygen difference from the alveoli to the, uh, to the artery. All right. So it's the difference in those uh, partial pressures. This gives us a measure of diffusion efficiency. So for example, what I talked about, right, is generally speaking that the alveolar um, partial pressure of oxygen is typically about 104. And if I were to uh, take, uh, take arterial blood and check the partial pressure there, it's about 95 millimeters of mercury. 
So the difference between these two, that's the AA gradient. And that difference in this example is 9. The average difference is, like you can see over here, the normal gradient is about 5 to 14. And so what it's telling you is it gives you a measure of diffusion efficiency because, you know, at this rate we know that at 104, I'm going to get about, you know, 95 millimeters of mercury of partial pressure of oxygen in my arteries under normal, with normal healthy lungs because of some of the mixing of venous blood and VQ mismatches that are all part of our normal physiology. However, if I were to say I have 104, all right, and now I have 85 in the arterial blood, well, now I have a, a larger difference in the partial pressure in my alveoli relative to the partial pressure in my arterial blood. So the question is, well, why, why is that? Why is it decreased? And well, you can see in this example in the chart, there's, there's three of them particularly that can cause that, that increase. So this actually helps us to sort of diagnose what, a disorder, what the disorder might be. And the idea is this, if there's a, diff, a, a large gradient, that means there's some defects in some way. I'm not getting the oxygen effectively from the alveoli into the arterial blood. And that could be because it's not diffusing well, all right? It could be because I have an increase in my VQ mismatches, uh, or I have complete shunt, all right, where I have, you know, complete, you know airways that uh, aren't exchanging gases at all with the, with, the, with the blood. And so that causes, you know, mixtures of blood that is very low in oxygen content and brings down that partial pressure of oxygen in our arteries and creates a larger gap. And so we refer to this as an AA gradient that we use this clinically, all right? Um, now, just so you guys are aware, in terms of knowing what the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is, we actually have to calculate that. We, don't, we can't measure it. And so the calculation we use to calculate for alveolar oxygen is we take the atmospheric pressure. So here at sea level, that would be 760 millimeters of mercury minus the 47, which is the water vapor pressure in our airways. Okay, multiply that by 21%, since it's 21% oxygen that we're breathing, and you subtract that from the partial pressure of CO2 in the artery, which is something we have to measure when we take the person's blood, and divide that by our constant here, which is going to be 0 0.8. Okay, and uh, so this is our, our formula, and if you calculate it out with the normal numbers that we have, all right, so 760 minus 47 and so on. This comes out to, you know, approximately about 100 millimeters of mercury. All right. And if you use the PCO2, which our normal would, again, be about 40 millimeters of mercury in our arterial blood. Okay. So that's going to give you a calculated estimate of what the alveolar partial pressure is. And then you can directly measure what the arterial is when we draw the arterial blood. You can measure that partial pressure. And then we take a look. Does it fall within the normal range between 5 and 14 millimeters of mercury difference? The average is probably closer to like 9 to 12, typically. And that tells us that this is a normal, a normal gradient. If the gradient is increased, then we start thinking about why it might be increased. And so we'll look at these three again. Okay. So again, this is just you know, visualizing some of the causes of hypoxemia that I just had listed in the chart. So here are two alveoli, here one and two. And this would be the, the blood flow going past alveoli 1 and 2 and how they combine here and the blood mixes. So it's sort of represent, representative of the whole population of alveoli, which there are millions, right? So here, decreased um, partial pressure of inspired oxygen. So this is talking about barometric pressure, so changes in the elevation. So we go to higher and higher elevations, the amount of oxygen we breathe in is lower. So that decreases the amount of oxygen that comes into our alveoli. So that's decreased everywhere. So this isn't changing how the oxygen itself diffuses. Right? Oxygen can still diffuse. It's going to mix. And it's, it's going to be a decreased O2 here. It's going to be a decreased O2 here. And so you're going to see a decrease in the O2 uh, when it mixes together and comes to the left side of the heart and into our arteries. Hypoventilation. So hypoventilation, we're not ventilating the alve alveoli as readily. So the O2 level goes down. The CO2 levels go up. That's going to affect... You know, in this example, it's going to affect all the vessels. All right, so you're going to see oxygen levels dropping in the blood. So it's causing hypoxemia. Now here, this is a, a shunt. So it's completely obstructed, completely blocked alveoli, and then you have a normal alveoli. So you're going to get normal oxygenation. Let's say, you know, 104 millimeters of mercury of blood leaving those alveoli. And then in the obstructed alveoli, it's essentially going to be 40 
not zero, it's 40 because remember that's basically what the partial pressure of oxygen is in venous blood. And when that mixes, it's going to really bring down that average. So you're going to have a decrease in oxygenation uh, of the arterial blood. Okay. Over here, you're seeing a decrease in VQ over on this alveoli. So there's obstruction of the airway. So there's decreased ventilation in that alveoli. There's an increase in ventilation over here. So you can get an increase in uh, partial pressure of oxygen here, decrease over here. Remembering that the decreased VQ will have more of an effect. So you can see a decrease in the oxygen. And it's, we call it a relative shunt because it's not completely obstructed as it is in this example over here. And then lastly, a diffusion effect. Oxygen can't readily cross this barrier. So it doesn't diffuse into the uh, blood vessels as well. In terms of an AA gradient, this E, F, and D over here would all have an AA gradient, and I'll explain that one at a time. Whereas uh, C and B over here, as well as A, obviously, this is normal, would have our normal uh, AA gradient. Okay, so let's start with the, the first one uh, that can cause hypoxemia, which is low inspired oxygen. Now, this has to do with, essentially with atmospheric pressure, so elevations that we travel. So some things to keep in mind here at sea level, again, 760 millimeters of mercury which you can see here, all right? When we breathe that air in, remember it gets humidified, so we subtract off the pressure from water that's being humidified. And uh, we multiply that by 21% since we breathe 21% oxygen, and you're going to get a partial pressure of oxygen about 150. Now, from previous lecture, you know that that 150, by the time it gets to the alveoli, is typically about 104 or so, okay? Um, now, this is going to be our standard sea level, so you can see the example New York Right, right here, for example. Now, if we were to go to higher elevations, you know, traveling to Colorado or somewhere else, right, the higher and higher elevations, what you'll see is that the air pressure, the total barometric pressure, decreases as we go to higher elevations. The proportions of gases don't change, though. And what else doesn't change is the uh, amount of water vapor that we're producing in our body. So even at high elevations, we'll still produce 47 millimeters of mercury of water vapor that's added to the air that we breathe in. And you can see the, the effect that that would have. So if you're here at 29,000 feet, 253 millimeters of mercury air pressure, minus the 47 over here from the water vapor, multiplied by 21%, you'd get you know a partial pressure of oxygen of 43, which is much lower than what we're used to at sea level. So again, that's just the quantity of oxygen that we're taking in is going to be less. So that's what this is showing you. If the decrease in the oxygen we're breathing in is less, right? then that means the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is going to be reduced as well. And then the partial pressure that we can reach in the, ar the arteries is also going to be reduced as well. All right, so for example, I'll draw the one alveoli over here, and here's the capillary. And we said typically at sea level, it can be about 104. And so we max that about 104 in that capillary right there. Or if it's our systemic arterial circulation, we're, we're talking about like a, a 95, this is about 104. Again, this is just representing, the 95 is representing the total arterial a partial pressure okay, of oxygen. And so we have an AA gradient of about uh, a 9. Okay. In this case, though, at higher altitudes, what's happening is that the partial pressure in here could drop, and we could have, say, instead 90 millimeters of mercury that's reaching the alveoli. All right. And we might have, let's say, um, we'll say 80 in our arterial blood. So we measured the arterial blood, and it's 80 millimeters of mercury, a uh, partial pressure. And so the AA gradient here would be 10. That's a normal AA gradient. It's just that the, the AA gradient you know, hasn't changed because there's no defect in our lung. It's still a healthy lung. It's still going to create the same ratio between what's in the alveoli and what's in the arterial blood. It's just that the numbers would be lower because we're not bringing in as much oxygen, okay? So the partial pressures are decreased. And so that's why you're seeing here down here in the chart. So the problem is low inspired oxygen. So the arterial oxygen is gonna be low. And the AA gradient, there's not gonna, this means no delta, no change. So there's no change in the AA gradient because we don't have any diffusion abnormalities. It's still going to exchange in the normal way it does. The CO2 on the other hand, will come down, so the amount of CO2 will decrease. And so to explain that, if we were traveling to Colorado at a higher elevation, 
we're going to have a lower um, quantity of oxygen that we're breathing in, so our PaO2 is going to go down. That's going to trigger our respiratory drive. We're going to ventilate more, so our alveolar ventilation is going to go up to bring in more oxygen. The effect of that is this. When we travel to higher destinations, remember our CO2 level is still normal. We're breathing normally. It hasn't changed. So that's still going to be at its normal level of about 40 millimeters of mercury in the arteries. But the oxygen content we're breathing is low, so it's, we're being triggered to breathe due to the hypoxia. And so that's going to increase the respiratory rate. And so the, that's going to bring in more oxygen, but it's going to drop our CO2 level. So the CO2 level will decrease so because we're ventilating more. So think back to that graph, that ventilation graph. I increase my alveolar ventilation, the CO2 goes down, but the partial pressure of oxygen is going to go up. And so that's what we would do. We would breathe more, we'd ventilate more at higher altitudes to try to offset that hypoxia. In terms of ventilation, this goes right back to the graph that I um, that I went over with you guys earlier, so I won't spend too much time on this, but there are many causes for hypoventilation that are pathologic. You could have some sort of CNS or central nervous system lesion, some sort of maybe stroke or something like that. A drug overdose uh, can be quite common. Uh, neuromuscular disorders that um, and also any kind of increase in airway resistance. These are all things that can result in reducing the amount of air that gets into the alveoli uh, per minute. And so the effect would be a decrease in that ventilation would be to decrease the partial pressure of oxygen. So we get less O2 in our blood. And it would be increasing the CO2 because we're not breathing off that CO2. So the CO2 level would increase. The AA gradient doesn't necessarily change because there's no diffusion effect. The gas is still exchanged, it's just uh, the partial pressures are, are changing. All right, The gradient has shifted a little bit, but in terms of this distribution, it'll still distribute the same way in the sort of the same example that I gave in the previous slide. Okay, So there's no defect in the lung itself per se. So the, part, the AA gradient would actually be the same, maybe 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury difference between the alveoli and the arteries. However, in terms of total, you know, partial pressure, yes, the oxygen would be less and the CO2 would be increased. Okay. Um, so an example that I've given before with this would be like someone who has obstructive sleep apnea. And they have to use like CPAP or something to, uh, to breathe. One of the, you know, the, the dangers of this is that it can cause diffuse hypoventilation to the lungs because they have an obstructed airway when they're, when they're sleeping. And so it hypoventilates, and uh, that decreases the amount of oxygen that they get and can increase the amount of CO2 and puts a lot of stress uh, on the body. Now, um, this is a, again, this is a combination of hypoxemia and hypercapnia. So this is to differentiate it from the altitude. In the altitude, there's a decrease in oxygen, so it's, there's hypoxemia, but there's also a decrease in the CO2 because we're breathing at a higher rate to, to bring in more oxygen. So we're, off, we're dropping our CO2 levels. In alveolar hypoventilation, you would see an elevation in CO2, a normal AA gradient, and the PaO2 would be, so would, be, would be dropped. So there's hypoxemia with elevated CO2 and a normal AA gradient. That would be alveolar hypoventilation. Okay, And this matters because we want to, first, this helps us to diagnose it if we see these you know, three features. Uh, and then the way we treat it, which I'll come back to later. Okay, so to talk about the diffusion uh, abnormality, so things that affect diffusion of gases, right? So again, to optimize gas exchange with the alveoli and the, the capillary, we want to make sure that that diffusion distance is very is very small. Uh, that we have a, a good you know partial pressure gradient. That we have a large surface area. So these are all things that would affect the diffusion of these gases. And so, it, you know, um, in this case, if we have a diffusion abnormality, all right, one of the, the primary effectors of that is usually some sort of thickening up of the wall. So it increases the distance the gas has to diffuse from the alveoli to get into the capillary. So we first need to understand, under normal circumstances, how quick does that actually occur? So, for example, you have blood flows. Uh, through the capillary, from one end of the capillary to the other as it's going through or past that alveoli, uh, it does that in about 750 milliseconds at rest, which is fast, right? It's less than a second that it spends uh, going past the alveoli. In that time, in 750 milliseconds, of that 750 milliseconds, 
it only takes 250 milliseconds all right, for hemoglobin to become completely or 100% saturated. So in other words, the hemoglobin that's entering into the capillary that's going past the alveoli, it'll completely saturate with oxygen in 250 milliseconds. All right? And then basically it's another 500 milliseconds before it leaves. So it's already, you know, uh, saturated uh, well within that time frame. And that's what this graph over here is showing you. If the partial pressure of oxygen coming into the capillary is about 40, all right, it's going to saturate very rapidly and reach, you know, uh, saturation at 100 millimeters of mercury within 250 milliseconds. So this is a very rapid process and it gives us a lot of leeway. Okay. So for example, when we exercise, the blood flow that's going past there, it shortens. The time it spends in the capillary shortens. It goes from, say, instead of 750 milliseconds, it can drop down to 300 milliseconds. So in 300, if blood is going to flow from one of the capillary to the other in 300 milliseconds, we're still saturated because we've saturated in 250 milliseconds. All right, so it gives us plenty of time. It gives us that leeway if we're exercising, the flow goes up that will still saturate in time, okay? And this is under normal circumstances. However, if for some reason I have a diffusion defect and there's an increased amount of time it takes for it to diffuse, I'm not gonna saturate with oxygen in 250 milliseconds anymore. It's gonna take a longer amount of time. And that's what this, these dotted lines are showing you. It's saying, all right, well, if there's some sort of diffusion defect, it could take a little bit longer. So let's say under resting conditions, the blood is flowing past the capillary in 750 milliseconds it might take 500 milliseconds for the uh, hemoglobin to become fully saturated because it's taking longer because the diffusion distance has increased. And that could be due to scarring or fluid filling up in that area because of pneumonia or something like that. Now, we'll still saturate, okay? And so that won't be a problem under resting conditions. But if I exercise, now it's a problem because if the flow increases to 300 milliseconds and it takes me 500 to saturate, now I'm not going to fully saturate if I'm exercising. So that's where this can become more, more problematic. And this is showing you the last line would be the worst case, which, which would be the worst type of diffusion deficiency, where you, basically it's taking me the full time to saturate because it's just taking so long for that gas to exchange. So this diffusion impairment, in terms of uh, effect on oxygen in the, uh, in the blood, there's really no change unless it's very severe. All right, because of the fact that oxygen can move across that barrier very rapidly means that it really requires a serious diffusion deficit for it to actually decrease that O2. So it only occurs if it's severe. In terms of the CO2, CO2 typically doesn't change. All right? It doesn't change because the CO2 actually moves even more rapidly than the oxygen does, and it can equilibrate much more readily. So we don't typically see a change in the CO2. In the A, for the AA gradient, under mild conditions, you're not going to see any change. There's going to be no change in the AA gradient if it's just mild. But if it's severe, if it's severe, then you'll see an AA gradient because it's not going to be able to saturate and, and get into the blood as readily. So we see it there. So in terms of diffusion abnormality, we'd only see an, an increased AA gradient if it was severe. Okay, that's when we'll see hypoxemia and an AA gradient. But the CO2 typically doesn't change. Now, in terms of the VQ mismatch, now this is a VQ mismatch other than our normal physiologic VQ mismatch. So this is in addition to something else that's causing this. Okay, something like a, a pneumonia could do that as well, or a bronchitis, or an asthma, or something. Okay, where it's decreasing ventilation to certain parts of the of the lung. All right. So in this VQ mismatch, if I have a low VQ, again bronchitis or asthma. That's going to reduce the ventilation relative to the perfusion, so that's going to decrease the amount of oxygen that gets into the into the blood, all right? And it's going to increase the CO2 again because it's a poorly ventilated area. Remembering the graph that that ventilation increases a decrease in ventilation is going to decrease the O2 that's exchanged there. It's going to increase the CO2 because I'm not removing it by ventilating. Okay. A shunt is just the absolute lowest VQ, which I've already described to you, right? So that means the, the ventilation has gone to zero, all right? And if ventilation goes to zero, all right, uh, I'm shunting blood past a, a, essentially a, 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 an empty alveoli. Now, in this case, the AA gradient would increase. 
So if we look at the cartoon over here, this is showing you a normal alveoli, and so the partial pressure of oxygen, normal, in the blood. And over here, I have some sort of fluid buildup, so it's, it's decreasing the ventilation in that area, and it's completely blocking it. So this is like a shunt. And so the partial pressure of oxygen in there is like the venous blood partial pressure. It's about 40. When that mixes, that could substantially bring down that partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. And so the difference, the alveolar gradient would be, you know, from 105 to, say, 60, which is a large AA gradient. So right to left shunt. Okay, so again, that's the shunting I just described. Decrease in the O2, so hypoxemia. The CO2 doesn't necessarily... Um, is not necessarily affected because of that, that linear relationship it has. If there's an area of low VQ and an area of high VQ, they can offset each other. The AA gradient, though, would increase. In the ventilation and perfusion inequality, so we're not quite as extreme as, as a shunt, but you know, varying degrees of it. Um, again, you have hypoxemia, you have an increase in the AA gradient, and the CO2 would not change either, unless the amount the amount of VQ uh, inequality was quite severe, okay? So in other words, we could have some of the CO2 uh, be offset by, you know, high VQ areas. However, if if the ratio or the proportion of, of area of the lungs is, is low VQ relative to normal or high, then you can actually st start to see CO2 accumulating because the areas that are normal or high can't offset it. So to kind of describe that further, that VQ mismatch. So this is this looks like that that uh, drawing that I've shown you guys before uh, earlier on. And so this is these are the airways, and you can see the blood, and of course the blood comes together here when it all mixes. And this is the example that I gave from before, that if I have an area of low VQ, that means low O2, high CO2. All right, this is how the effect it has on the on the blood that's leaving there. Right, the O2 is going to be something less than 100 millimeters of mercury, and the CO2 is going to be, you know, greater than 40. I'm not getting good exchange there. Over here, where I'm ventilating better, all right, it's going to be the opposite. So this is sort of like what we see even typically in our normal lungs, which have high and low VQ areas. And like I said, the high VQ area can offset the low VQ area in terms of the partial pressure of CO2. Doesn't do so do as well or as effective as, as a job in the oxygen. So oxygen levels tend to go down a little bit when we reach this point. So there's usually a slight decrease in our, our PaO2 and the CO2 is, is normal. On the other hand, let's take this as our example. Let's say if this was our area of low VQ, let's, let's turn three of them into low VQ and one of them is high VQ. Okay. So in this condition, so this is a pathologic condition where there is far more uh, you know, alveoli areas that have a decreased VQ. And I have one area of, of a high VQ. Okay. Now, under normal circumstances in the lungs, we can kind of offset each other because of the, 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 the ratio of high to low VQ and the normal areas. In this area, there's really no normal. It's, it's either low or it's high, and, it's, and the proportion of low is far greater. So what happens in this example is if I have a low ventilation, that means I have a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood that's leaving these, um, cap, uh, assuming these alveoli, and I have an increase in the partial pressure of CO2. Right, and that's happening at you know each one of these three alveoli, and then again the partial pressure of oxygen is greater in this area of high ventilation, and the CO2 is lower. When it mixes here, however. When we get to this point where all that's kind of coming together, the PaO2 is going to be substantially reduced because now we're mixing, you know, a lot more uh, lower lower oxygenated blood uh, relative to the amount of highly oxygenated blood. And so it can't, even under normal circumstances, it doesn't, you know, fully equalize. So this is really going to bring that partial pressure of oxygen down. So this person would be definitely hypoxemic. On the other side of it, though, the CO2. Under normal conditions, if it were low to moderate levels of low or low ventilation areas, we could offset that a little bit with you know and keep the CO2 levels normal based on that linear relationship that I talked about earlier. However, if the proportion of low VQ areas is, is significant and severe, what's going to happen is the CO2 levels are going to rise and it's not going to be fully offset anymore by the, the high VQ area. And so CO2 levels can start to rise.
And this is an example you might see in somebody who has a, um, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like COPD, or somebody who has um, emphysema, for example. So something you might see clinically in these patients, right? So for example, somebody who has COPD is oftentimes they're, you know, chronically hypoxemic, so their oxygen levels are low. So we would see sometimes, depending on how severe it is, you might see them actually getting oxygen through like a nasal cannula or something like that uh, to help bring up that oxygen level. And their CO2 levels remain um, sort of elevated, so chronically elevated, so they can retain more CO2. They sometimes refer to them as like CO2 retainers. And so their CO2 levels can be uh, a little bit higher. And uh, at least initially, you can start to see their respiratory rates might actually be increased at baseline, simply because the CO2 is triggering the respiratory drive to, to breathe in more, to try to bring in more oxygen, and to, um, to blow off some of that CO2. Okay, so there are many causes of hypoxia or low oxygen. And what I want to kind of just tie this into is how oxygen therapy can be helpful or essentially useless. Like how effective is oxygen therapy? We tend to think that if somebody's low in oxygen, just give them oxygen and that should work. But it doesn't always work because there's a, a multitude of different reasons to be hypoxic. Okay, so some will be effective and some will not. So some of the causes, let's talk about that first. Uh, inadequate oxygenation of blood in the lungs due, due to some sort of extrinsic reason, like you're at high altitude, like you've just moved to, you know, high altitude like Colorado, or hypoventilation, right? Uh, pulmonary disease, you have pneumonia, or to be more relevant, COVID, right? So these can, these can affect uh, the lungs directly in the tissue. Venous to arterial shunt, so we talked about VQ mismatches, so a complete VQ uh, mismatch would be a shunt. We can also have a shunt due to a heart defect, which we'll cover more in cardiology, but that's basically where venous blood is going from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, so it's bypassing the lungs, and it's going to be mixing with that oxygenated blood and bringing down that oxygen content. Inadequate oxygen transports to the tissues by the blood. So in other words, this could be somebody who has a reduced number of red blood cells and hemoglobin, somebody who's anemic. Okay. Inadequate tissue capability of using oxygen. So they could have cyanide poisoning, for example, which disrupts the electron transport chain, so they're not utilizing the oxygen that they're getting. But there's maybe nothing wrong with their lungs or the amount of hemoglobin that they have. So this is just to show you um, briefly. Uh, there's many examples of what can cause hypoxemia. Now, in terms of giving oxygen therapy, in some of these cases, it will work, and some it will not. Okay. So for example, oxygen therapy will improve things like high altitude. Right, you're increasing the amount of oxygen they're breathing, and that's the main problem is that the oxygen content is lower. Hypoventilation. They're ventilating less, they're bringing less oxygen into their alveoli, and so the partial pressure is decreasing. If I give them, you know, 100% oxygen to breathe, that's going to increase the partial pressures and improve that oxygenation. Impaired diffusion uh, hypoxia. Well, yeah, if it's diffusing, remember, part of what I can do to improve diffusion, if there's some sort of diffusion abnormality, so it's taking long for the oxygen to get across that barrier, I can actually give them oxygen and increase the gradient. So it increases the drive that oxygen is going to have to get across that barrier. All right, so I can improve that. So I can increase that drive. So oxygen will work um, in diffusion abnormalities. It will work in some mild VQ mismatches. As long as I don't have a complete shunt, if it's just a mild VQ mismatch, I can increase the, the partial pressure of oxygen in those low VQ areas because I'm driving more oxygen into those areas. So that will overall improve the oxygenation of that area. Uh, so you know, pretty much for most of the things that we talked about, most of the conditions I talked about, oxygen therapy would be helpful. Okay. However, oxygen therapy offers little to no improvement in the cases that you can see in the green box over here. If somebody's anemic, all right. Uh, they may be already fully saturating the amount of hemoglobin that they have. All right, and so by giving them oxygen, I'm not really promoting any further saturation at all. It's I have to correct the, the anemia. Uh, abnormal hemoglobin, uh, excuse me, abnormal hemoglobin transport of oxygen. Uh, again, if there's some sort of you know issue with hemoglobin, again, this is something that has to be corrected. If it's not by giving oxygen, is not going to improve its ability to bind to that hemoglobin if the hemoglobin is normal, abnormal. Uh, circulatory deficiency, right? They have a perfusion issue. There's some issue with the heart, or there's you know some sort of pulmonary embolus that's blocking up the, the perfusion to the lungs. Uh, the oxygen uh, is not likely to to help in that case.
for example, with you know a pulmonary embolus, if it's blocking up flow to some of the alveoli and it completely obstructs the blood flow to that area, uh, I'm creating you know um, a, a dead space. So the alveoli it may be ventilating, but I'm not going to be exchanging any, any gases. So even if I give oxygen to that area, it's not going to be effective. Uh, circular to assume shunts uh, won't work because there's no oxygen going to the alveoli at all. It's completely obstructed, so giving oxygen is not going to get into that alveoli. Uh, and any inadequate tissue use of oxygen, like in cyanide poisoning, uh, giving it more oxygen is not really going to help. So there are times, you know, when giving the oxygen just really is not going to be very effective, and it really just depends on us being able to figure out what type of hypoxia uh, we're dealing with. And so that's why I went through talking to you guys about looking at the the arterial partial pressure of oxygen, the CO2 level, and the AA gradient, because that's going to help you differentiate a lot of the different pulmonary disorders, many of which will actually be effective in, in treating with oxygen, with the exception of the, the shunt. And some of these others, like anemia and so on, that we would find out from other labs and, and such, uh, they would be maybe less effective. So here, this is really just summary, major respiratory causes of hypoxemia, all right? High altitude, so this is just a summary of how it responds to oxygen. So you can see at high altitude, they'd respond to oxygen. Hypoventilation, uh, they respond to oxygen therapy, okay? Uh, however, it doesn't correct the elevated CO2. So remember, if you're hypoventilating, you are reducing the amount of O2 you're, you're, you're getting in from the atmosphere, but you're also not getting rid of the CO2. You're not exchanging it. Uh, so the CO2 levels would still be high. So if you gave them oxygen, the CO2 levels will still remain high, and you'd have to actually typically, especially if it's like a drug overdose or something like that, you might have to actually ventilate them, all right? Put them on a respirator so you can control the respiratory rate and help them blow off that, that, that excess CO2. Diffusion abnormality would respond to oxygen therapy by increasing that drive. A VQ mismatch, again, may respond to oxygen therapy depending on um, the extent of the VQ mismatch, okay? And then the shunt, which is like a complete obstruction of an alveoli. Uh, that doesn't respond at all to oxygen therapy because no oxygen gets into that obstructed alveoli and increasing the partial pressure of the already healthy alveoli doesn't significantly increase the overall oxygen content in the blood. So this is just a cartoon to quickly just to, uh, uh, demonstrate that. So taking just the example of the shunt. Okay, so up here this is the, the shunt. And uh, you see here we've completely blocked one of the, one of the alveoli. So yeah, in that alveoli, you're gonna have a decrease in oxygen content because we're not bringing in any from the atmosphere and an, an elevated CO2, all right? The CO2, because the CO2 will continue to diffuse into, the, into that blocked alveoli, so that continues to go up. The effect on the blood, again, is gonna mirror that, so it's gonna be uh, decreasing the PaO2 in, in the blood that's leaving that alveoli and an increase in the CO2. So it's gonna look a lot like venous blood in terms of its partial pressure. And so this is our normal alveoli. If I give O2 therapy, all right, none of the oxygen is actually going to get, so this arrow is depicting the oxygen, none of it's going to go to the blocked alveoli. So I'm not improving any oxygenation here. It's still gonna be like venous blood. And I'm gonna increase the PaO2 in a healthy alveoli, and that's not going to significantly increase the PaO2 overall, just because I already saturate pretty much at 100% under normal conditions anyway. So it doesn't significantly alter that. So when those two mix together, I haven't really altered the partial pressure of oxygen at all. In the impaired diffusion example, so the green little uh, hash marks down here represent that there's like a thickened wall or an increase in the distance of diffusion, maybe because there's a fluid buildup of pneumonia from pneumonia or something like that. So it's taking longer for oxygen to diffuse across that barrier. Okay, so it takes longer. Oxygen therapy in this case, would be useful because what I'm doing is I'm increasing the O2 gradient by increasing the partial pressure of oxygen inside the uh, alveoli relative to what's in the blood. I've, I have a larger gradient which is going to cause that O2 to move more readily into the blood. So it increases the gradient and so I can essentially drive that oxygen in. So in this case, oxygen therapy would be useful. All right, that's all I have for, for this lecture and I will see you guys in the live Zoom session.